Unless you live under a rock, you've probably noticed that lately it seems like everybody is suddenly going on strike. You've got the actors and writers in Hollywood on strike. You've got the auto workers at the big American car companies on strike. We've recently had transportation workers like employees at UPS on strike. We even have strikes in healthcare with Kaiser Permanente workers going on strike. And if you look closely, what you will also notice is that these strikes are all happening with unionized workers. So what exactly is going on with unions and strikes right now? Are we seeing the beginning of the underdog starting to fight back? The unlikely upset, this David versus Goliath story of poor, poverty-stricken, powerless workers banding together to finally get what they deserve from the big, evil, powerful corporations? Or is it possible that something else altogether is happening here. In order to answer that, first we have to understand what the real problems are. Instead of just looking at symptoms, we can peel the layers back and figure out what the real root issue is. And that real root issue is the Federal Reserve and fiat currency. If you don't know who I am, my name is Joe Brown. I run Heresy Financial University, where active investors learn how to make more money and lose less investing. Members get unlimited access to all the training material. If you are interested, link is in the description below. Let's start off with a little economics lesson about the boom bust cycle and how it is caused by fiat currency. Whether you have a small local bank doing this or a large central bank for an entire nation doing this, the process is the same. For one reason or another, the bank will decide to lower interest rates to stimulate more borrowing. This is because under a fiat system or even a fractionally reserved gold system, loans will cause new money to come into existence. So if you go get a loan today by swiping your credit card or a loan to buy a car or a loan to buy a house, that money did not exist before the loan was created. It was not a transfer from somebody else's bank account. It was loaned into existence. The lowering of interest rates and some other monetary policy tools will cause more people to want to borrow borrow more money, they will then go spend this money. As that money gets spent, it goes from one bank account to the other with a larger circulation of money. As this money goes from one bank account to another, that happens through purchases, which means that you have a bidding up on average of the prices of the goods and services that are being purchased with that new money. Eventually the debt has to start getting paid back because it's debt, that's what debt does. At that moment, the central bank could choose to lower rates yet again to stimulate more borrowing to pay off that old debt and restart that cycle over again. And if you repeat this too many times, eventually you get hyperinflation. Alternatively, the central bank could decide to raise interest rates or hold them steady, allow the deleveraging to occur, allow that debt to get paid off, and then you get the bust because less money is in circulation now as people deleverage, pay off their debt, money ceases to exist as that debt gets paid off, and now you have the reverse where prices collapse back down to where they were before or maybe even lower. The reason why it's important to understand the boom-bust cycle and how it is fueled by a fiat currency is because of the way that prices react to that new money. In other words, prices don't all go up at once when money is printed. As an example, take a look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and we can see when they started printing money in early 2020 and their balance sheet exploded by a few trillion dollars. However, at the exact moment that the money printing started, the rate of inflation actually declined and it took over a year for the rate of inflation to get just back to where it was before. After that, it then spiked to record highs. You'll notice this was not true though with asset prices. While asset prices like the stock market did initially decline, they bottomed when the money printing started in March of 2020 and very quickly recovered back to their all time highs just a few months later. This is a demonstration of the Cantillon effect. This this is the path that money follows when it comes into existence. On average, when a large surplus of money is created, the first thing that happens is that asset prices respond because it's very quick for asset prices to move. Whether it's real estate, stocks, crypto, or other, asset prices can be bid up extremely quickly and they're usually the first to do that. One of the main reasons for this is because the people with the big money that have enough buying power to move markets recognize that eventually that new 
money will cause higher prices. So they want to preserve their purchasing power and their wealth, and so they buy assets ahead of time. This buying causes those asset prices to go up in somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This means that the rich and those who buy the assets are shielded from that future inflation. The money printing actually benefits them. But eventually that new money starts to work its way throughout the economy. People buy things and then who they bought it from gets the money and then they spend it on something and they then those people spend that money on something. Eventually that money bids up the prices of everything and starts causing inflation to set in in goods and services. Now for the wealthy, they don't care as much because your cost of living, if it doubles from $50,000 to $100,000, doesn't really matter a lot to you if you're wealthy. But if you are an employee making an average salary, this could be devastating for you. And if you're a low income earner stuck in poverty, it can literally be life-changing in a negative way. But there is a third phase to this money that most people ignore, and that is wages. First, the newly printed money hits asset prices, then it hits goods and services, and then it hits wages. Essentially, after people have to experience their cost of living going up, and they may be getting one or two or 3% raises, but they can no longer afford the same things that they've always been able to afford in the past, they get fed up and they either leave to get new jobs that are higher paying, or they negotiate with their current employers for higher wages. And seeing as how the percentage change in real earnings over the past year have not been stellar, and that recently real earnings have actually declined, and real earnings is the difference between what you get as a pay raise versus what the inflation rate is. So if you get $1,000 more in a year, but it costs you $2,000 more just to afford the same stuff, you gotta pay cut, even though it looked like you got to pay raise. So all of these strikes that we are seeing right now are part of that final process of the money printing. This is people finally getting fed up and saying, I need more money. And people are now negotiating with their current employers to get it. In fact, there are now more workers striking than there have been since 1983. Interestingly, 1983 was the last time inflation was also very high. For the next moment, I would like to share with you about a very important company who is sponsoring today's video, Monetary Metals. The reason why I think Monetary Metals is doing something revolutionary goes back to when FDR outlawed gold ownership with Executive Order 6102. What most don't know about this executive order is that it also outlawed the gold clause that was common in debt contracts that allowed people to get repaid in gold if they wanted. Fast forward to 1971, when Nixon took us off the gold standard for good, and there was no reason for that law to be in place anymore. And what even fewer people are aware of is that law was actually repealed, which meant that it became legal to denominate debt contracts in gold yet again. Now, for the longest time, I was not aware that this was legalized in the United States, let alone that there was any company out there actually doing it. However, when I discovered monetary metals, I realized this is exactly what they are doing and nobody else is. They have created a way for you to start getting on your own personal gold standard by paying you a yield on your gold, denominated in gold, priced in gold, and paid in gold. They have multiple offerings like leases that pay between two and 5% and bonds that have paid up to 19%. Now, just to be clear, this means that if you have 100 ounces of gold at 4%, you would end the year with 104 ounces of gold. It is denominated and paid in gold. Regardless of the price of gold, regardless of what the dollar does, your gold is actually growing. Now, I have spent quite a bit of time over the last two years now researching how this company does what they do, getting to know the team. And as a result, I've become not only a customer myself, but I've actually also personally invested into the company. Monetary Metals is doing something truly unique unique, revolutionary, by paying you a yield on your gold, priced in gold, and paid in gold. And I highly recommend and encourage you to click on the link in the description below and get started by opening an account today. Now, at this point, you're probably unconvinced. You're probably still looking at this and saying it is still an issue of corporate greed. These big, powerful, money-hungry businessmen are just keeping all the profits for themselves. They're the problem, not the government. But I'm gonna show you one more piece of evidence that will hopefully persuade you that the root issue is deeper than that. It is caused by the money printing. It's becoming more and more common and knowledge that 1971 something changed. And that thing that changed was that 
the United States left the gold standard. In fact, it took the entire world off the gold standard. And for the first time in human history, governments were freed up to print as much paper money as they wanted, restricted only by political will. And of course, if they print too much, then the money loses too much value and people stop accepting it, so the government loses all power. So it's always this balancing act for the government. Do I print more money to get more purchasing power now and then risk not having it later? Or do I print less and not have as much money to spend right now? Looking at a few charts from WTF happened in 1971.com, we can see the net result of this unleashing of the money printer. Productivity and compensation were in lockstep from 1948 through 1972 until they diverged and productivity continued to increase along the same pace, yet worker compensation stagnated. We can see this another way by looking at real GDP per capita, the blue line that goes all the way up to the top never changed. The amount of wealth Americans have produced has still continued to increase. But looking at the red line, which has gone sideways since 1970, the real median weekly earnings of full-time workers has not grown. We can also see that the income gains shared by the top percentile and the bottom percentile were in lockstep until the early 70s when they split apart. Looking at it another way, we can see that starting in the early 70s, the bottom 90% of earners stopped seeing increases in their earnings, while the top 1% of earners saw an explosion. So the plight of most American workers today cannot be chalked up to corporate greed. The fact is, corporations have always been greedy. Yet the situation with inflation, wages not keeping pace with inflation, and temporary excess profits for large corporations are a relatively new phenomenon, at least to the extent that they're happening today. Corporations didn't wake up two years ago and suddenly decide to get greedy. As a side note, workers are also greedy. You may say that their greed pales in comparison. You may say that a starving person cannot be greedy for food, but the internal selfish desire for more is greed. Just because your title is employee rather than executive does not exempt you from moral depravity. So the people who are a part of these unions who are all going on strike, they are seeing a symptom. They're just not seeing the real problem, which means that their medicine will likely be worse than the disease. We can also see this demonstrated throughout history. For instance, the United Auto Workers Union is asking for 36% raises in general pay over four years. They're asking for a 32 hour work week with 40 hours of pay. They're also asking for pensions and other increase in benefits. But the problem is any of these demands come only at the cost of other labor. Because if the cost of hiring a union worker goes up, that means I can't hire as many union labors. It also means that all of those people who would have been able to get that job can no longer get that job because I can't afford them which means it drives that person to seek non-union labor, which means now there's more demand for non-union labor, which drives down the cost, meaning there are more potential employees now seeking non-union jobs as a result of not being able to get those higher paying union jobs, which means they're competing against each other now for even lower wages. So unions are less of a battle between workers and employers and more of a battle between union labor and non-union union labor. And when union labor gets its wishes, it gets them at the expense of non-union labor. And over the last couple of months, and I'm sure over the coming months, you will see many people talk about the benefits of unions and how if you're a part of a union, you have all sorts of extra benefits. You've got better pay, better job security. You don't have to worry about working harder to advance. You just got to show up and do your job and put in your years and you'll climb up the ranks. But there is no free lunch. There is always a trade-off. There is always a cost. That is is the nature of the universe that we live in, and that will never change. And most people are incapable of looking past the seen consequences of the one person with the union job getting a higher pay. And they don't realize the unseen cost of the person who goes without a job as a result, or has to take a lower paying job as a result, because that is not possible to show up in the statistics. Yet all we have to do is look at the utter collapse of Detroit over the last 
five decades to see the harm and the disaster that results from removing a free market. And it's not just economic harm. Unions historically have been inherently violent because in reality, there is no way to prevent competition without the use of force. And the whole idea of a union and going on strike is to prevent competition of labor. Because if me and my buddies go on strike, but somebody else is waiting in line to take that job instead of me, I have to prevent them from being able to get that job or else my strike is ineffective. And make no mistake, unions have used extreme violence for their entire history to accomplish these goals. For a strike to work, they must shut down the enterprise. They have to close the market to everyone else. If too many individuals defy the strikers, the union must resort to force. Unions must actively interfere with freedom of trade in labor markets in order to be able to deliver their promises. In order to do this, unions have resorted to mass picketing, insults, threats, throwing rocks, Models, car chasing, abusive phone calls, physical assaults, property destruction, and even murder. Oh, but it gets worse. In 1983, the Industrial Research Unit of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania published a 540 page book on the history of union violence in America. They found examples of murder, assault with intent to kill, destruction of property, arson, sabotage, mayhem, shooting, stabbing, beating, stoning, dynamiting, intimidating, threatening, and abuse of every sort. And no, this wasn't just the Teamsters that they looked at. They found almost 2,600 incidents in the database that involved 131 different unions. In fact, they only found six unions in their entire sample where there was no record of violence. The authors concluded that the overall purposes of the violence was to attain union objectives through the blatant and often unpunished use of force and coercion. The use of force and the initiation of violence to force somebody to give you something that you want and take it from them is a short-term strategy that may result in you getting what you want now, but it's much worse than biting the hand that feeds you. It's cutting off the hand that feeds you and then using that hand to murder the person that feeds you. Now, there's obviously nothing wrong with free and voluntary association. And wanting to be a part of a union is no different. In fact, going on strike with other members of a union is no different. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But for some reason, historically, this always seems to be accompanied by violence. And if you have to use violence or coercion to stop somebody else from taking a job at a wage that you won't take it at, that just means you're incompetent and you're scared that somebody else who is better than you will outwork you and do a better job at what you were doing for less pay. And if they want to do that voluntarily and freely, you have no right to stop them. And when you look around at the specific industries that you see these unions wielding a lot of force, wielding a lot of power, and the strikes that are happening today, you see industries that are on the verge of collapse. Hollywood, very clearly, for years now, has been at the end of its life. Healthcare in America is getting worse by the year. Quality of American cars has been declining while the price has been skyrocketing. And no amount of force or violence will change that in the long run. It will only accelerate is demise. The problem of inflation and wages not keeping up with inflation are a huge problem today. But the root cause is the money printer. The root cause is the government. The root cause is overregulation in labor markets. The root cause is force. And today's strikes, today's unions, are a medicine to deal with the symptom that will result in something worse than the disease. It'll just kill them slower. And finally, if you'd like to up your investing game and be able to make more money investing and also lose a lot less, learn how to de-risk yourself and not have large losses, learn advanced options, trading strategies, hedging, portfolio allocation, fundamental analysis for bear market investing, and much, much, much more, you need to join Heresy Financial University. It's $99 a month. You get every single course that I've ever published and every future course that I will publish as well, and much more coming soon. Link is in the description below. As always, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.